Hey everyone, before we get into today's episode, I just wanted to let you know that my candle company, Knox Investa, has just released three new scents for the season. The first one up is Casper, which is named after my sweet bean and delightful dog, Casper, obviously. While it's sweet, it features a lot of honey, cream, and sponge sugar notes. The fragrance doesn't overwhelm your nose either. It somehow remains light and fluffy, just like Casper clouds. The next candle is called Sorrento, and this one is inspired by the time where I used to live in Italy for a while. It is a super breezy, citrusy, airy scent. And we even managed to somehow get in leafy notes with like some herbs and tomato in there too, to really just bring this smell into a full immersive cycle. It's weird to explain, but you can kind of feel like the fuzziness of a tomato vine in the scent, but yet it all still works. It is really, really special. And the last scent that we're bringing in this new collection is called Empyrean. With this fragrance, you're gonna start with fresh ginger blossoms and you're quickly carried into heavier notes of frankincense and cannabis. This scent is very mysterious and it's a little difficult to describe. It's smoky, lightly floral, but very deep and rich. And I just love the ginger blossom right on top. It just really adds something. So if you'd like to check out these candles or anything else from the line, make sure you go to noxvesta.com or click the links in the description box. Slave contracts. That's the first thing that catches my eyes about the K-pop industry. While the bright colors, upbeat music, and dance crazes quickly amassed the world's attention, the biggest K-pop stars were locked in decade-long contracts that mandated their clothing, outrageously long working hours, and so much more. While the K-pop craze is associated with lighthearted entertainment, it seems like the industry itself is everything but that, and slave contracts are just the start. Hello everyone, and welcome to The Corporate Casket. I'm the Illuminati, and today we're going to be talking about the K-pop industry. As we speak, K-pop fans of the massively successful group BTS collectively hold their breaths to find out if the members of the group will have to go on hiatus. At the height of their career, the group is currently waiting patiently or very anxiously to find out if they will have to put their careers on hold to complete their mandated military service. BTS exploded on the scene in the late 2010s and became massively famous, not just in Korea, but all around the world. While their music was widely popular, their consistent acknowledgement of the issues within the industry, particularly revolving around mental health and the exploitative slave contracts gained them massive notoriety. BTS broke through many of the barriers most other K-pop stars deal with. In an interview with Time in 2018, a member of BTS said that the group came together with a common dream to write, dance, and produce music that reflects our musical backgrounds, as well as our life values of acceptance, vulnerability, and being successful. With these goals in mind, BTS seemed to break the mold of the K-pop industry. They signed no slave contracts, they write their own music, they manage their own social media, and frequently discuss their struggles and anxieties associated with the massive pressure to be an extremely polished image at all times. But despite their wild success, BTS is still currently under obligation to serve their two-year required military service under Korean law. However, some are arguing that their massive success should be given a waiver since they are promoting the country's image on the international stage. The laws do actually give some exemptions from military service requirements for Olympic athletes or people who have won awards for classical music and art. But currently, no such exemptions apply to pop music sensations. So while K-pop fans collectively wait to find out the fate of their favorite superstars, we'll have to wait and see what happens too. So how did BTS or K-pop get so outrageously popular that it seems like the entire world is waiting to find out what happens with each of these groups? Where did K-pop even come from? What's going on in this kind of shady industry? Well, that's what we're gonna take a look at today. So let's get into it. While it seems like the K-pop global phenomenon suddenly appeared in the early 2010s, Korean pop music actually planted its roots way back in the 1990s. After the reformation of the South Korean government in 1987, South Korean citizens were granted access to a wide variety of music, including contemporary American music for the first time. In the years following, televised talent shows erupted in popularity in Korea and were vital to introducing new music groups to a wide audience. It was at one of these talent shows that K-pop was first introduced to a massive audience. In April, 1992, the band Seo Tahi and the boys performed their song, Nan Areo. Now they did lose the competition. Not only did they lose, they actually got the lowest score from the judges. However, those judges' tastes seemed to be immediately proven wrong. When their album officially dropped, it stayed at number one for months. With this, the pop group would change the course of Korean music and the industry for decades to follow. 
Just a few years after Seo Tahi's groundbreaking performance, massive music studios started popping up across Korea that set their sights for creating and managing new K-pop idol groups. Three music studios led the industry, including SM Entertainment created in 1995, JYP Entertainment created in 1997, and YG Entertainment created in 1998. YG was actually developed by one of the founding members of Seo Tahi and the Boys. And from here with the big three, they worked to create a new genre of not just music, but performance as a whole. It wasn't just the upbeat and poppy tempo of the music that drew in massive crowds, but it was also the performance. The flash, the style, the choreography, all of it set K-pop apart from other genres. The genre became widely known internationally in 2002 with the release of Psy's Gangnam Style. Over the next five years, the video for this one song would rank up more than 3 billion views on YouTube, becoming the most watched video on the platform until it was finally replaced in 2017 by Wiz Khalifa and Charlie Puth's See You Again. An MTV exec told the BBC that, Psy completely shattered the mold and the myth in terms of what it takes to get to number one, not only in the US market, but worldwide. Psy was not a Korean version of a big pop star. Psy was Korea's version of Psy, and it turns out that's what the world wanted. As K-pop continued to flourish, specialty schools were developed that taught children how to prepare for life as pop stars, teaching them not only singing and dancing, but how to moderate their public image and create a work ethic that would put them at the top. During this stage, the wannabe idols are considered to be trainees and are often contractually obligated to follow strict rules and regulations. During a talk show appearance on Radio Star in 2017, one former trainee explained how the boys and girls were kept separate. She told the host that boy and girl trainees weren't able to say hi or even be in the same rooms together. Even after they reach the point where they are in the public eye, many of them are told not to date for at least three years. But what about texting? Well, that's out of the question too. In fact, many trainees are denied any access to their personal cell phones until after they have won first place in a music show. Then there's the impossible and dangerous standard that is often held for the physical appearance of the trainees. There is reportedly a strict diet plan trainees are expected to follow. So strict in fact, that many K-pop stars have shared stories about sneaking food into their dorms. Even BTS told a story on their YouTube series about a time they had snuck out to go get some ice cream. Apparently, while they were walking down the street enjoying their indulgent snack, the members noticed a black van following them. Thinking it might be their agency, they shoved the ice cream into their pockets. It turns out that creepy black van following them was in fact their agency. So yeah, that's not creepy at all, right? Not only do trainees suffer through outrageously strict diet plans, but they also go through mandated weight checks, which by the way, are done in public view around everyone else. Apparently, these were so stress-inducing that some trainees would cut their nails short, go to the bathroom repeatedly, and spit out saliva to reduce their weight. As you can imagine, at some point, this expectation of perfection becomes unsustainable and even exploitative to the massively young stars that K-pop invents and promotes. While the world saw the bubbly positivity and colorful performances from the young artists, something darker was happening in the background. The industry became rife with exploitation, harassment, and tragedy. While the whole world was distracted, what was really going on behind the scenes of this industry? Perhaps one of the biggest issues in the world of K-pop was their use of, and I wish I was making this term up, slave contracts. These manipulative and extremely restricted contracts between talent and their massive recording studios or management teams first came into the limelight in 2009. By this time, global sales for the Korean pop music genre had reached over $30 million. But in the background, the stars responsible for growing the industry were exploited, abused, and even starving because of their ultra restrictive contract terms. These so-called slave contracts are often offered to young aspiring pop stars by agencies that can average roughly 10 to 13 years in length. The contract terms claim that members of K-pop groups or individuals activities, quote, belong to the agency, and they require the artists to appear for performances and broadcasts that are demanded by the agency, even when the performers didn't want to. With the belief that people belong to a corporation, there are bound to be things that go wrong. In 2009, the K-pop group TVXQ brought this issue into the limelight when they sued their agency, SM Entertainment, for exploitation and unfair contract terms. The group was on a 13 year long contract that restricted them from working with another management group or agency. Meanwhile, they were repeatedly denied most of the profits from their successful career. According to Choi Jun Han, the former head of the Korea Entertainment Law Society, these types of contracts were the norm. He said that, quote, 
celebrities were made into stars by their agents and agencies. These young artists need to be invested in for at least 10 years. Basically, he insinuated that because agencies invested so much into the stars, they needed these long-term contracts so they could get a return on their investment. While that may be the case, it doesn't excuse the agencies from offering widely unequal and exploitative pay distributions to their clients. SM Entertainment claimed that they had offered to pay the group 11 billion won, amounting to about $8 million. And while that may sound like a lot, that was nothing in comparison to the amount that the group and groups like them had made the agency over the years. A month before the group filed the lawsuit, the Fair Trade Commission had offered a recommendation for a standard contract. However, it wasn't legally mandated, so most agencies pretty much ignored it. Eventually, the group actually won their lawsuit in a Korean court, which prompted the FTC to conduct a thorough investigation. But we'll speak on that a little more in just a moment. Immediately following the group's massive victory, nothing much really changed within slave contracts. Groups continued to sign with agencies under these types of contracts. One of the best examples I found was this group called Rainbow, who was interviewed by the BBC. Rainbow is a seven member K-pop girl band. Like others, the group is committed to a long-term seven year contract by their management company, DSP. The group says that they work long hours, but their parents were reportedly heartbroken by how little the girls were being paid. The director of DSP does say that the management teams share their profits with Rainbow, but also says that after the agency recoups its costs, there is sometimes a little left for the performers. Basically, the management group is saying that after they pay the choreographers, wardrobe assistants, lessons for singing and dancing, and of course themselves, they have nothing left to give back to the people who are making them money. That doesn't sound right. The musicians associated with smaller agencies are in even more danger of being exploited by them. A former member of a K-pop boy band who spoke to the journal Korea Expose anonymously told them, "'Singers with no names who belong to the smaller entertainment agencies are the most vulnerable members within the music production system. My K-pop group was basically forced to sing for free by our company and event organizers. We had to perform many times with no income, just waiting for the day we'd hit fame." Apparently, this issue is so persistent in the industry that musicians have a running joke that goes something along the lines of this. If we can buy cigarettes with the profit from the song, we did okay. If we can buy a pack of fried chicken, we have succeeded. That's a yikes on trikes. There have been some provisions made in an attempt to help struggling musicians, but it doesn't seem to help much. In 2011, the Artist Welfare Act was put in place in Korea after an award-winning screenwriter died from starvation. But for people to be eligible to receive support from the government, they first have to complete a running list of expectations. They have to submit a list of the albums they produced within the last three years and provide proof that they made more than 1.2 million won, which is about $1,100 within a year and 3.6 million won or $3,200 within the last three. Apparently these wage requirements are meant to prove that someone was a professional musician. But if the issue we're trying to solve is that professional musicians and other artists aren't being paid, then how exactly is this supposed to help? It turns out it doesn't really help much. Young Jun Soo, a manager at the indie label Bunker Buster pointed out when he told the Korea Expose, "'Considering it takes a long time to produce an album, this law doesn't really reflect reality at all.'" Then in 2017, there was another major change that hopefully could help put an end to the exploitative nature of the K-pop industry machine. After the completion of the FTC's investigation into eight agencies, they demanded that the slave contracts be stopped and no longer offered to trainees. The ruling came after the FTC found that agencies imposed penalties on their trainees who are usually teenagers or younger if they had left the business. And when I say penalties, I mean some serious penalties. They could range anywhere from about $86,000 to $129,000. And as a reminder, these are usually kids or young teenagers singing these contracts and they're also not making any money. So how are they supposed to pay back over $100,000 for leaving? The FTC's new ruling required agencies to seek only the amount of direct investment in the trainees and nothing more. Additionally, the FTC found that agencies would punish people who tried to join a different agency after their contract ended. They would do this by charging them double their investment cost. In response, the FTC put new rules in place that would hopefully stop this from happening. One of the other biggest issues with agency slave contracts has been the reliance on morality clauses. Unfortunately, these have been used to force artists into horrific situations, which we will speak more on in just a moment. Agencies could fire people or release them from their contracts on meaningless and even predatory grounds under the guise of morality. In an attempt to address the issue, the FTC implemented new rules that agencies had to give their trainees a 30 day grace period before they were terminated. Hopefully some of these new provisions can help artists maintain some autonomy in the industry in a way they never have before. Unfortunately, 
even with the new provisions, there have still been some running issues with K-pop contracts being exploitative and overbearing on their stars. I'm gonna go ahead and put the ad break in here. That way you have about two to three minutes to decide if you want to stick around and hear some of the more graphic and painful details of the underbelly of this industry, or if this is where you're gonna bow out of today's episode. With that being said, here are the ads. What's the key to consistent good hair days? Well, using ingredients that benefit your hair. Function of Beauty makes hair care products that are 100% customizable, made for your hair where it is now and where you want it to go in the future. Function of Beauty is the world's first customizable hair care that creates individually filled shampoos, conditioners, styling, and treatment formulas based on your hair. It's founded by a team of engineers and cosmetic scientists, and each Function of Beauty product is individually designed to be as unique as you are. And they mean it too, because they offer over 54 trillion possible formulations. And it's super easy to get started. You just take the quick hair quiz that builds your hair profile and you select your hair goals, like what you wanna do. Do you wanna lengthen, volumize, oil control? Tell them. Then you choose your color and fragrance or go dye in fragrance free. As per usual, I think a lot of you guys know, I love the peach scent. I just love anything peach scented. And I like the light blue color. I think it's really fun. So I just kind of keep doing the same thing again and again. I'm sorry for the, not having the variation, but I know what I like and, and they figured it out. Then you get your freshly filled formula delivered straight to your door and just prepare for good hair days ahead. So say goodbye to generic hair care for good. Go to functionofbeauty.com slash casket to take your hair goals quiz and you'll save 25% on your first order. Go to functionofbeauty.com slash casket to let them know you heard about it from our show and to get 25% off your first order. Again, that's functionofbeauty.com slash casket. Take your hair quiz and save 25% on your first order. Now you're allowed to switch things up when you feel like it. Maybe yesterday you were jamming to country music, God forbid, but today maybe you're deep in a throwback playlist. Your go-to dessert is usually creme brulee, but maybe you could go for a slice of cake right now. Well, with Dipsy, you can always choose what feels good in the moment. Dipsy is an app full of hundreds of short, sexy audio stories designed by women for women. And they bring scenarios to life with immersive soundscapes and characters, no matter who you're into or what turns you on. And speaking of what you want to explore, Dipsy now has sleep stories, wellness sessions, and they even offer written stories too. And I'm gonna tell you the sleep stories is my new favorite. Like it actually helps. I feel a little goofy saying that, but going to sleep and just hearing something nice narrated in your ear as you're just kind of drifting off, is kind of nice. For listeners of the show, Dipsy is offering an extended 30-day free trial when you go to dipsystories.com slash casket. That's 30 days of full access for free when you go to D-I-P-S-E-A stories.com slash casket. Dipsystories.com slash casket. As we begin this next section, I would once again like to provide a trigger warning. This next section will discuss suicide, sexual harassment, and assault. If you do not feel like you're in the right headspace at the moment to hear about any of these topics, feel free to skip the rest of this episode. The struggling mental health of the idols in the industry has been no secret. And even after the FTC's new regulations, there have been a string of idols who did take their own lives after leaving notes that they felt isolated, overworked, and depressed. And As a quick trigger warning, I am briefly going to mention a few idols who have taken their lives. In 2017, Jong Hyun took his life after leaving behind a heart-wrenching note that read, I am broken from inside. The depression gnawed on me slowly has finally engulfed me entirely. Then only two years later, superstar idol Sully's death following multiple complaints from her about cyberbullying and pressures of the industry seemed to be quickly followed with more tragic losses. Other stars, including Gu Hara, just six weeks later, and Cha Inha, just a few days following. The string of devastating suicides shocked the K-pop world and brought to light yet again, the horrific aspects within the industry that are often so hidden from the world. Unfortunately, it does not get much better from here. In 2009, Jane Ja Ji-yoon, a Korean actress, committed suicide. She had left behind a note saying she had been forced to go for drinks and have sex with public figures under the threat of her contract being revoked had she refused. Her final note implicated over 30 professionals in the entertainment industry, including some of the biggest names in Korean music agencies. This is a painful and devastating example of the corrupt and harassment riddled entertainment industry that lies underneath the happy and sunny profile of K-pop. As I mentioned before, agencies could often fire their trainees for morality clause violations. 
this can be and has been used to threaten trainees who refuse sexual advances or worse. Not only this, but it seemed like nothing was being done to address the 30 people she had named until much later on in the Burning Sun scandal. In 2012, the CEO of Open World Entertainment, Jane Suk Woo, was arrested and charged with sexually assaulting his female trainees and coercing male idols signed to his agency to do so as well. According to Korea Times, the CEO had previously been a boss of a criminal gang and owned a nightclub before turning to management in 2007 though his lawyer adamantly denied that he was ever related to any criminal enterprises and said, there are reports of the defendant being related to criminal gangs and violence, but that is not true. He has no relations with them. Regardless of his past, it was his pattern of sexual harassment and assault while operating a management agency that were the true issue. According to investigators, he had been abusing his trainees since the beginning of open world entertainment and would often take them out and tamper with the trainees' alcoholic drinks. He was able to continue his reign of terror through thinly veiled threats that if they reported him to the police, he would ruin their careers. He warned his victims by telling them, there is no one in the entertainment community whom I don't know. According to the Kangmen police station in Seoul's statement, he did initially admit to some of the charges against him, though people were not entirely sure which ones. Following his arrest, two male idols were also arrested for sexual harassment in connection to the case. After the shocking news of the ring of harassment, abuse, and exploitation was released to the public, Open World Entertainment issued a statement. But onlookers realized there was something missing. While the company apologized for having caused disappointment, they made no apology to the multiple girls who had suffered abuse from their CEO. There were no condolences, no apologies, just nothing for the girls and young women that were impacted. However, they did ask the press to be kind to the male artists who had, quote, suffered from the wrongful accusations the media has hurled at them. So I don't know, take that as you want. Somehow it just doesn't sit well with me. One year later, Jane Suk Woo was sentenced to six years of prison after he was found guilty of sexually assaulting three trainees. He appealed his case claiming that the sentence he received was unfair, but thankfully his appeal was unsuccessful. The court statement read, He insisted that the assessment of the case was unjust, but according to the criminal action law, that insistence can only be counted with the death penalty of a sentence of 10 or more years of prison. In addition to his six year prison sentence, he was also required to take a 40 hour sexual assault healing program. Though I'm not exactly sure what it entails, it is at least something. However, in a statement that seems to always occur after cases like this, Yang's lawyer decided he needed to remind the world of the success he had, and he said, The defendant acknowledges and admits all charges against him. However, the defendant worked hard for the spread of Hal Yu and is a true businessman in the nation's entertainment industry. As much as I would love to say that this is the only kind of story that has come out in the K-pop and Korean entertainment business in general, it's not. In May, 2017, a CEO of a Korean entertainment agency was arrested for, quote, brokering his agency's female trainees. More plainly put, it meant he was forcing his female trainees into prostitution, otherwise known as trafficking. This was his second arrest, and it only came months after he had served his first sentence. Identified only as CEO Mr. Kang in sources I was able to find, the man had been convicted of brokering or trafficking four of the trainees from his agency back in 2015. According to the Korea Herald, he found two women who were willing to fly to the US to spend a night with a businessman in return for a sizable monetary compensation in an attempt to delay payment for a previous investment. After his trial, Kang was sentenced to 18 months in prison and fined 15 million won, which amounts to a little over $12,000. Unfortunately, I couldn't find many details on the accusations for his second arrest, but I'm assuming it was similar to the first. For his second conviction, he was sentenced to 20 months in prison and given a fine of 20 million won, which is a little over $17,000. At this point, I would really love to tell you that this is one of the only times this type of thing has happened within the industry, but I can't because I would be lying. In fact, this instance seems almost tame comparatively. And that's right, it does get worse. And now for those of you that are familiar with K-pop, you will be aware of the scandal, but for those of you who are not, we're gonna be speaking about the Burning Sun scandal. The Burning Sun scandal is perhaps the biggest one to ever happen in the world of K-pop. Sure, the slave contracts have caused a stir in the industry and beyond, and certainly the past history of sexual assault and harassment has led people to quietly question what's going on in this billion dollar industry. But Burning Sun was catapulted into the limelight and shocked fans and artists alike. So what happened here? 
Well, it started with Lee Sung Hyun, who was also known as Sangri. He had become a massive influence in the world of K-pop after the insurmountable success of one of the biggest boy bands, Big Bang. He was the youngest member of the band and his flashy and extravagant lifestyle had earned him the nickname Korea's Great Gatsby. His fame reached beyond Big Bang as he amassed a notable solo career in Korea and Japan, starring in movies, going on solo tours, and even holding positions of leadership in the YGX agency, a ramen shop, and of course, a club named Burning Sun. The massive scandal and investigation into the nightclub would have its start in December, 2018, when music video director Kim Sang Kyo posted a video to a forum online about a dramatic and horrific night he had experienced at the club. It retells the story of him leaving the nightclub after a friend's birthday party, when suddenly a girl came running up to him seeking protection from a man. When he tried to stand in between the girl and the man chasing her, he was struck by the man and then multiple others joined in. Then the Burning Sun security guards themselves started to attack him. When he finally escaped the beating, he told the police his story, but much to his surprise, the police ignored it. And they sided with the security guards and also assaulted him after taking him into custody. He went on in the video to describe yet another incident that took place just 10 days after his own. And he said, "'Less than 10 days after my incident occurred on November 24th, a woman who was intoxicated by something was dragged by her hair by a burning sun guard down a VIP hall. The woman grabbed onto the computer and desk and seemed to be in need of help, but the staff ignored that. I received information that the woman reported this to the police, but the police let it pass and burning sun deleted the CCTV footage. Then his story went viral in January and exploded into the Korean news cycle. However, Burning Sun quickly on January 29th released statements on the video. While the director did say, no matter the reason, I apologize that violence was committed. He went on to place most of the blame on Mr. Kim, you know, the person who had been assaulted multiple times by both security guards and police. He said, as is seen in the CCTV footage, I witnessed Mr. Kim approaching female guests numerous times. And as civil complaints from guests increased, I couldn't let it pass. It's true that there is ambiguity about harassment due to the particular nature of it being a club. And I don't know what it is, but this is not a satisfactory answer. Something seems incredibly off to me about someone starting a statement by saying, you know, violence isn't right, but also this guy just kind of deserved it. I don't know, it, it just multiple red flags just shoot up all at once. Something is not right here. They also said that they had given all of the videos to the police and the police then released a statement saying that they would investigate it. From there, the story snowballed. In February, The Dispatch, a Korean newspaper, released group texts that were allegedly from Burning Sun employees that discussed sexual assault. The real shock was the illustrious Korean Great Gatsby that was not only included in the group chat, but he seemed to be one of the ringleaders that was arranging prostitutes for visiting investors. The text included an eerie exchange between Sangri and employees, one that was simply identified in Soompi as employee Kim. Sangri texts employee Kim and requests that he prepare a spot in the main area of the club arena and call the girls for a foreign investor coming in. The two continue the conversation to discuss the arranged club area in the club where foreign visitors could meet with prostitutes and confirm that the girls would do a good job. But despite the release of those text messages, it still seemed that people involved were just going to deny, deny, deny. Only hours after the release, Sangri's agency YG released a statement saying, Upon checking with the artist himself, the text messages in the article are fabricated and not true. In addition, just as we have always done, we inform you that we will take strong legal action against the proliferation and reproduction of rumors and fake news. Despite the denial, the police didn't seem to fully buy into the idea that the texts were fake and they finally began questioning him and found other employees about suspected trafficking in the club. As police announced their investigation to the public, YG and Sangri started acting, well, really suspicious. YG had a shredding company spontaneously pull up to their headquarters. And while they reported it was simply a quarterly procedure for them to shred documents, Korean newspapers reported it nonetheless, saying that the company had thrown away large quantities of shredded material. But that isn't where it ends. Sangri also canceled all of his highly anticipated concerts in four different cities. Then the police made an announcement after the raid of the club saying that they had, book Sangri and changed his status to that of a suspect in order to issue a search and seizure warrant and clear him of suspicion. Despite the police saying they were going to clear him of the suspicion, he quickly announced that he would be retiring from showbiz to protect his boy band, Big Bang and its backer, the talent agency, YG Entertainment. 
Then after all the denials and all of the accusations, someone finally took some accountability. Another singer who had been caught up in the scandal, Jung Jun Young admitted to his involvement and announced he would be stepping back from the music industry. On March 12th, he released a statement that read, I admit to all my crimes. I filmed women without their consent and shared it in a social media chat room. And while I did so, I didn't feel a great sense of guilt. More than anything, I kneel and apologize to the women who appear in the videos who have learned of this hideous truth as the incident has come to light and to the many people who must be angry at the situation over which they cannot contain their disappointment and astonishment. Over the course of the next month, the case just grew and grew and grew. There were allegations of police corruption after it was found that some police members may have been involved in the group chats too. Sayangri was brought in for yet another round of questioning and YG began to be investigated even further, not just for their involvement in the Burning Sun case, but for tax evasion too. By the end of March, 14 people had been found to be involved in the group chat, many of them being major celebrities or intrinsically involved in the Korean entertainment industry. The accusations seemed endless. They ranged from prostitution, sexual assault, human trafficking, embezzlement, and much, much more. One man, a Methodist pastor, even came forward during the investigations to claim that he had traced the stories of runaway teenagers back to Burning Sun. He claimed the club used scouts to recruit young girls to work at the clubs. Then after they'd worked there for a few months, the girls would be offered up, sometimes dosed with the date rape drug GHB to wealthy guests. The man called clubs, the city and the music industry, a culture of sex trafficking by elites. Then finally, after a year long investigation that led to the arrest and questioning of a wide variety of stars and entertainment executives alike, including a former YG employee, singer Jung Jun Young, and of course the Korean Great Gatsby himself were arrested. They were finally indicted on multiple charges, including organizing prostitution, habitual gambling, and illegal foreign currency trade. Following his indictment, YG did its best to try and erase Sayangri from the public's collective memory. They quickly removed him from Big Bang's website and even erased him from the group's portrait as if he never existed. Despite the extensive investigation, when it came to his time in court, Sayangri denied most of his charges. However, his denial of being involved in the convoluted ring of sex trafficking, abuse, and drug trafficking seemed to fall short. His trial was concluded in the military court after he had enlisted in the army for his 21 months of service. In the end, he was sentenced to three years in prison for his crimes, which included providing prostitutes to foreign businessmen. He was also fined 1.15 billion won, which translates to about $989,000. Following an appeal and his admitted guilt to the charges, he saw his prison sentence reduced to a mere 18 months in January of this year. While Burning Sun is certainly the biggest controversy to sweep the K-pop industry, it is not the only one and it will likely not be the last. While there have been some headway to address slave contracts and sexual assault within the industry, both of these issues still seem to persist. Still, people are fighting back against them more than ever before. But with all of that being said, that's where we're going to end today's episode of The Corporate Casket. I hope you learned something new here today. And if you did, make sure you're liking, following, and subscribing so you can stay up to date on all the latest episodes. Thank you so much for spending some of your time here with me today. I really do appreciate it. And I'll see you in the next one. Bye.